George Sewell Boutwell, January 28, 1818, February 27, 1905, was an American statesman who served as Secretary of the Treasury under President Ulysses S. Grant, the 20th Governor of Massachusetts, a Senator and Representative from Massachusetts and the first Commissioner of Internal Revenue under President Abraham Lincoln. Boutwell an abolitionist, is primarily known for his leadership in the formation of the Republican Party, and his championship of African-American citizenship and suffrage rights during the Reconstruction. Boutwell, as U.S. Representative, was instrumental in the passage and construction of the 14th and 15th Amendments to the United States Constitution. Secretary of Treasury Boutwell made much-needed reforms in the Treasury Department after the chaos of the American Civil War and the impeachment trial of President Andrew Johnson. Secretary Boutwell controversially reduced the national debt by selling Treasury gold and using greenbacks to buy up Treasury bonds. This process created a shortage of much-needed cash for farmers in the western states and territories. Secretary Boutwell and President Grant thwarted an attempt to corner the gold market in September 1869 by releasing $4 million of gold into the economy. Boutwell, as U.S. Senator, successfully sponsored the Civil Rights Act of 1875, signed into law by President Grant. In 1877, President Rutherford B. Hayes appointed Boutwell Commissioner to codify the Revised Statutes of the United States and in 1880 to serve as United States Counsel before the French and American Claims Commission. As the national industrial interests desired reconciliation with the South, Boutwell's advocacy of equality for African Americans declined within the Republican Party. Boutwell fell out of favor with the Republicans when he advocated in 1880 that Congress needed to take effective measures that would destroy the Solid South. At the turn of the 19th century in 1900, Boutwell himself abandoned the Republican Party, opposed the acquisition of the Philippines, and supported William J. Bryan for president. Early Life on January 28, 1818, George S. Boutwell was born in Brookline, Massachusetts, near Boston. According to his autobiographical memoir, Boutwell was raised on his family's farm in Lunenburg and attended public school until the age of 17. During the summer months he worked barefooted, tending oxen and picking chestnuts. Boutwell was educated in arithmetic, algebra, geometry, and Latin grammar. From 1830 to 1835, Boutwell worked as an apprentice and clerk for Simeon Haywood, who owned a palm leaf hat store. While completing his education, Boutwell worked briefly as a teacher in Pound Hill. Boutwell graduated public school in February 1835. From 1835 to 1838, Boutwell worked as a clerk and shopkeeper in Groton, Massachusetts. In 1836 he began to study law under attorney Bradford Russell, whose office was above the store where he clerked. Boutwell did not take the bar exam or enter into active practice until many years later. Having finished his clerkship, Boutwell became a partner in the shop, from 1838 to 1841. While Boutwell ran the store, he began a personal regimen of reading and writing in an effort to make up for having chosen not to attend college. Boutwell made his public career debut when he served as a pension agent for widows of the Revolutionary War that had ended in 1783. He traveled to Washington, D.C. and was impressed after seeing Daniel Webster. After talking with a black slave woman whose youngest child had been sold to Louisiana, Boutwell became dedicated to the anti-slavery cause. Boutwell married Sarah Dillieth Ayer on July 8, 1841. Sarah was the daughter of Nathan Haler from Hollis, New Hampshire. 
their marriage produced two children, Georgina, May 18, 1843, and Francis, February 26, 1847. Political career, 1839-1861. Entering politics as a Democrat and supporter of Martin Van Buren. Boutwell was first appointed head of the Groton Post Office by his business partner, who had been appointed postmaster. Boutwell's first entry into elective politics was a successful run for the Groton School Committee as a temperance party candidate, he would sit on that committee for many years. The success prompted him to run for the state legislature on the party's ticket, because the party was a small third party he lost badly. In 1840 he won the Democratic Party nomination, despite temperance opinions that were offensive to many, but lost in a Whig landslide. He finally won on the third try, defeating incumbent John Boynton in 1841. He won re-election twice before being defeated in 1844. Although he also lost in 1845, he was returned to the state legislature in the 1846 election, serving from 1847 to 1850. His elective successes, sometimes in the face of major Whig victories statewide, highlighted Boutwell's potential, and brought him into the Democratic Party's leadership circles. He sat on the Judiciary and Finance Committees where he gained a reputation for thorough research into legislation, and advocated positions favoring free trade, restraint of the money supply, and increased taxes for spending on education and other reforms. He supported the Mexican-American War, which, unlike others, he did not view as a major slavery-related issue. While in the State House of Representatives, he also ran three times for United States House of Representatives, losing by significant margins to his Whig opponents. In 1848 he was considered for the Democratic nomination for governor, placing third. In 1849, he was appointed state banking commissioner by Governor George N. Briggs, a position in which he inspected bank charters that were subject to renewal. In this position, he gained a wealth of experience in matters of banking and finance. Massachusetts Governor Throughout the 1840s, the issue of abolition of slavery grew to become a significant force in Massachusetts politics. Outrage over the extension of slavery into territories acquired in the Mexican-American War increased the popularity of the Free Soil Party but they and the Democrats were unable to unite to unseat the Whigs who dominated state politics until 1850. In 1849, Boutwell won the Democratic nomination for governor. Because no candidate won a majority, the Whig-controlled legislature decided the election, choosing the incumbent Briggs. The campaign brought Boutwell into close contact with Charles Sumner and Henry Wilson, leaders of the state Free Soil Party. The parties flirted with the idea of a coalition, with the Democrats adopting an anti-slavery platform. In 1850, passage of the Compromise of 1850, in particular, the Fugitive Slave Act, sparked further outrage, and the Democrats and Free Soilers were able to agree to a coalition. On the Democratic side, Boutwell and Nathaniel Prentice Banks agreed with Free Soilers Charles Sumner and Henry Wilson on a division of offices should the coalition win. The key to their success was control of the state legislature, which would decide the election if no gubernatorial candidate won a majority of the popular vote. Both parties worked to bring out the vote in rural areas sympathetic to their cause. Although Governor Briggs won a plurality of the popular vote, 57,000 out of 120,000 votes cast, he did not win a majority, and the legislature was controlled by the coalition. 
pursuant to the terms of the deal Boutwell was elected governor, Banks was made Speaker of the House, and Wilson was elected Senate President. Sumner's election to the U.S. Senate was contested by conservative Democrats, but the coalition eventually prevailed in choosing him. Boutwell was criticized by Free Soilers for taking a hands-off approach to the contentious election of Sumner, neither supporting nor opposing him during the balloting in the state Senate. Sumner later accused Boutwell of preventing a more permanent fusion of the two parties. In the 1851 election, the results were similar, despite efforts by the Whigs to drive wedges between the coalition members, and Boutwell was again elected by the legislature after the Whig candidate won a plurality. That election exposed cracks in the coalition, principally on slavery, so Boutwell decided not stand for re-election in 1852. The Whigs regained control of the legislature, and were able to elect John H. Clifford to the governor's chair. On May 26, 1851 he was elected as a member of the Ancient and Honorable Artillery Company of Massachusetts. In Boutwell's first term, both houses of the legislature were controlled by the coalition, and a substantial reform agenda was passed. Election by secret ballot was enacted, although the terms did not satisfy all of the secrecy rules of an Australian ballot, as was plurality voting under some conditions. The state legislature's seats were changed from town-based allocations to legislative districts that were not based on town boundaries. 36. Laws governing the issuance of bank charters were streamlined and the Harvard Board of Overseers was reorganized. Boutwell also engaged in a wholesale reassignment of patronage jobs in the state, which had all been filled with Whigs. In his second term, Whigs controlled the House of Representatives, and were thus able to thwart most of the reform agenda. Boutwell's call to increase taxes for spending on education, prisons, and mental hospitals went unheeded but the legislature was able to pass a call for a constitutional convention to discuss long-standing calls for changes to the state constitution. A main law temperance reform bill was also approved, but Boutwell was criticized by the Whigs for vetoing the first version of it and then signing the second, allegedly under pressure from free soilers. Constitutional Convention and Republican Party Boutwell was elected a delegate to the Massachusetts Constitutional Convention of 1853. He opposed the abolition of the Governor's Council and the election of judges, and supported the elimination of any poll tax requirements for voting. He served on the committee responsible for drafting the proposals that were submitted to the voters for approval, and was disappointed when all of those proposals were rejected. After the convention, Boutwell took up the study of law in the office of Joel Giles, a patent lawyer from Groton. He was retained by Middlesex County to oppose the formation of a new county out of parts of western Middlesex and northern Worcester counties. He helped found the Groton Public Library, and continued to be active on the Groton School Committee. In 1855, he was appointed Secretary of the State Board of Education, a post he would hold for five years. Boutwell's law studies concluded when he was admitted to the Massachusetts Bar in 1862. In the aftermath of the coalition breakup in 1852 and the failure of the 1853 convention, Massachusetts political parties broke down into factional interests. In August 1855, four major factions were holding meetings in a Boston hotel, attempting to find common ground for the upcoming state election. Boutwell convinced the groups to attend a grand meeting, at which he argued that they should form a union against slavery. Out of this and related activity the state's Republican Party was born. Despite his role in its early formation, 
Boutwell remained somewhat apart from the organization because of his job at the Board of Education. He did however continue to speak out against slavery, noting that the nation was embarking on a period of intense trial, and that people will make war over slavery. In 1860 he chaired the Republican State Convention, and openly supported Republican candidates for office. Early Civil War Years Boutwell attended the Peace Conference of 1861 in Washington, D.C. which attempted to prevent the impending Civil War, and served as a liaison between the federal government and Massachusetts Governor John Albion Andrew in April 1861. In the Peace Conference, he angrily rejected Southern proposals favoring the extension of slavery and its enforcement in Northern states, arguing that the Union is not worth preserving if such measures are needed to do so. In June and July 1862, Boutwell served on a military commission in the Department of War, investigating irregularities in the Quartermaster's Department of General John C. Fremont who commanded the Union Army's Department of the West. Assistant Quartermaster Reuben Hatch, whose brother was a political supporter of President Abraham Lincoln, had been defrauding the department, and the commission was established on Lincoln's order to forestall a court-martial. Boutwell spent two months in the Army camp at Cairo, Illinois under conditions he described as disagreeable to an extent that cannot be realized easily because of flooding and unsanitary conditions. The commission cleared Hatch. In July 1862, while he was still in Cairo, Boutwell was appointed the first Commissioner of Internal Revenue by President Lincoln. He spent his eight months in that post organizing the new Internal Revenue Bureau. He was described by Secretary of the Treasury Salmon P. Chase as having the highest obtainable ability and integrity, and oversaw the growth of the Bureau to some 4,000 employees. It was the largest single office department in the government. Boutwell decided in 1862 to run for the United States Congress. The campaign was dominated by the issue of emancipation which Boutwell strongly advocated. He won a comfortable, 55% to 40%, victory over Charles R. Train, a conservative former Republican. He resigned as Internal Revenue Commissioner early in 1863. U.S. Congressman First elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1863. Boutwell came to the chamber already celebrated for his financial expertise. A reporter noted that with his first day of service on a committee, he became recognized as one of the most promising freshmen. A practical matter-of-fact man, the journalist wrote. A dark-skinned man, dark-eyed, dark-haired, thin in the flank, vigilant, self-contained, quiet giving you the impression that he would wake up quick and in strength. A speech from him is premeditated logic of unwoven facts and figures, delivered in a magnetic current which flows to the nerves of every man in his audience, however great he may be, and which penetrates through and through. It is impossible to escape impression from Boutwell's debate. As an adversary he would be fatal to a bad cause formidable to a good one, as an ally he is a tower of strength. On July 4, 1865 after the Civil War ended, Rep. Boutwell gave a speech that advocated African-American suffrage, echoing Thomas Jefferson's principal view from the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal. Boutwell envisioned the post-war United States as a nation of equality where both whites and blacks could have the vote side by side, and believed that African American suffrage would secure the nation as well as protect African Americans. The congressman quickly gained a national reputation as a radical Republican. During Reconstruction, he served on the Joint Committee on Reconstruction, 
which framed the 14th Amendment that gave African American freedmen citizenship and established the inviolability of the United States public debt. Boutwell advocated the 15th Amendment that gave full suffrage rights to male African Americans. Mr. Boutwell is the last survivor of the Puritans of a bygone age, the French reporter Georges Clemenza informed his readers, a man after the heart of John Bunyan, too much of a fanatic to command the attention of the Senate, but too honest and sincere for his opinions to be ignored by his party. Boutwell opposed the Reconstruction policies of President Andrew Johnson from the first weeks of his administration, arguing that any remaking of the former Confederate governments must begin with steps to open the electorate to blacks as well as whites. He warned that black rights and loyal unionist safety could be protected no other way. In time, he turned into one of the most militant advocates of Johnson's impeachment, and by far the most respected of them. Unlike his colleagues, a hostile observer wrote, he brought to the cause the advantage of a cultivated mind, an extensive reading and a scholarly acquaintance with all of history that could be mustered into such a service. In December 1867, he made the case for impeaching the president without charging him with having committed actual crimes, contending, in effect, that impeachment was a political, and not just a judicial process. He did not expect impeachment to pass and did not foresee the Senate convicting Johnson, what he hoped for, instead, was a statement on the House's part that the president had committed high crimes and misdemeanors in effect a resolution of censure. The House did not agree, but two months later, in February 1868, Johnson's removal of Secretary of War Edwin M. Stanton, in contravention of a law drafted by Stanton and Boutwell requiring Senate confirmation of such acts, united Republicans behind a resolution of impeachment. Boutwell presented the Articles of Impeachment to the House for debate, and he was chosen as one of the managers of the impeachment that followed. The bulk of the trial work was handled by fellow Massachusetts Congressman Benjamin F. Butler, although all seven managers were involved in developing the case against Johnson. Boutwell was given the honor of giving the first closing speech, all seven managers and five defense lawyers, spoke. His speech was not particularly notable for its rhetoric, but defense lawyer William Everts seized on Boutwell's strained analogy of casting Johnson into deep space to provoke significant laughter and applause. The impeachment failed by a single vote. U.S. Secretary of Treasury Boutwell had been given serious consideration for a place in President-elect Ulysses S. Grant's cabinet, and is reported to have declined the Interior Department. Within a week of the inauguration in 1869, Grant's first choice for the Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander T. Stewart, was found ineligible, and the President had to look for a replacement. Republicans on Capitol Hill Feeling that the cabinet as a whole was weak in members combining Washington experience with solid party credentials, joined to urge him to accept Boutwell, and, tendered the Treasury portfolio, Boutwell accepted. His selection caused some embarrassment to Grant's Attorney General, Ebenezer Rockwood Hoar, who was himself from Massachusetts, by custom. No state was allowed more than one cabinet seat, and Hoare offered to retire. Grant refused the offer, but a year later, without warning or explanation, sent a messenger demanding his resignation. The business community held Boutwell's selection. The news of his appointment created an immediate jump in government bonds on the money markets. Nor is this to be wondered at. The Commercial and Financial Chronicle commented, for Mr. Boutwell is well known as an earnest advocate of conservative financial reform.
that he is an able administrative officer he gave conspicuous proofs when in 1862 he was entrusted with the organization of the new Internal Revenue Bureau. Indeed, a Secretary of the Treasury has never probably been appointed whose qualifications were submitted beforehand to a more varied series of tests. Never has such an officer on taking the seals of office been greeted by such hearty generous universal welcome. Boutwell, at that time popular for his two impeachment attempts of President Johnson, was easily confirmed by the Senate controlled by the Republicans. As a radical member of Grant's cabinet, Secretary Boutwell often acted independently of President Grant and took on a haughty attitude toward other cabinet members. Boutwell died in Groton on February 27, 1905, and is buried at Groton Cemetery. He was memorialized in a major celebration at Faneuil Hall, Boston, on April 18, 1905. His house in the center of Groton, built in 1851 while he was governor, was given to the Groton Historical Society by his daughter, Georgina. It now serves as the society's headquarters and is open in the summer as a museum. It is listed on the National Register of Historic Places as the Governor George S. Boutwell House.